We're looking forward to having everyone participate and join in on our webinar today. Um, this is part two of our Reinventing Performance Strategy M4P webinar series. Give your managers a 12 year head start. And so um, as we do that, I wanna make sure this is interactive so you can put any questions that you have in the chat area. We will take time as we move along to answer those. And for sure at the end, make sure we're able to get responses back to, to everyone on those um, questions that pop up. And so I um, wanna get a chance to introduce our speakers today. And so we have Raina Fryer. She's our Senior Director of People and Learning. She's phenomenal. She's really good at coaching um, and she's really impactful, an uh, imp impactful part of our team. So excited to have her speak with you today. And then we have Edgar Jones. Edgar's a VP of Coaching. Edgar comes from a long background of athletics and business performance and excited to hear um, what Edgar has to say on this topic. And then myself, I'm vice president here with M4P, and I'll be covering some of our content today as well. And so um, just a basic introduction about M4P and our mission. Our goal here is to help turn managers into coaches and teammates into top performers. We want to help organizations, re organizations really bridge this people first component and how you create these great pro you know, productive and engaged um, cultures. And we know that a huge part of that is impacting the manager levels of your organizations. And so within that, we look at today's topic. The average person has their first direct report at age 30, but doesn't take their first management training class until the age of 42. How do you bridge the management gap to get the people in your organization up to speed and ready to be people leaders without expensive formal training? And so we're going to give you some of the keys that we really believe in today and really make sure you guys can get a head start and jump start your people and give them a 12 year advantage and head start on where they're at and their people leading capabilities. And so uh, with that, I want to pass it over to Raina Fryer. Thank you, Ben. I mean, I think there is nothing more vital to a business's long term health than making the decision in a sense like succession planning on future leaders and then cultivating their growth. You know, one of the biggest concerns of today's market is the attraction and retention of talented people. I'm sure you're all experiencing the hiring crunch um, right now as we are. Talented people want to work with other talented people and work with good leaders in an open environment where they too can be developed into really effective people leaders. So we've found that there are three solid ways to help build a steady and reliable pipeline of leadership talent. The first way is to really focus on individuals' development. We do that through growth, providing growth opportunities, opportunities for stretching people, and opportunities for people to make an impact. A players are always looking for opportunities to grow. Development in this crazy talent market is one of the top ways to retain talent. All of the research is showing that. So if we aren't providing context and vision for our future leaders around growth, stretch, and the impact that they can provide for you in the future, we're truly doing them a disservice. If you can, we really want you to think ahead and start planning towards and for the next 12 to 18 months of your business. If you can plan ahead, you can create development and stretch opportunities to prepare your top performers for the future of their career. We want to get them really excited for the potential next step in their career by planning at least 12 to 18 months out. We also have this generation of employees that put in a lot of hours of work. These individuals want to know that it does have the impact that, that they're having with their work does impact the world in a positive way and that our organization or your organization is impacting them in a positive way. The second way to build a, a pipeline is to measure progress regularly. I mean, we understand that it can be difficult to keep tabs on how every single employee is developing as your company grows or evolves, but Checking in on your employees once a year is just simply not enough. More of that traditional once a year performance conversation. We want to be having regular touch points outside of more formalized conversations, coaching, providing guidance, feedback when we can, wherever we can. So it is important to know whether the right people are moving at the right pace into the right jobs at the right time. Um, a performance management software like M4P allows you to see how your team members are doing, what they are accountable for, and how it relates to their roles. 
And utilizing the various information that performance management software provides allows you to facilitate discussions related to performance on an ongoing basis or as needed rather than having to wait. So everything is really visible and transparent for your individuals. This is gonna promote an agile and flexible team setting and ultimately it's gonna help drive the success of your organization. And then the third way is to provide coaching. You know, coaching our employees is more than just the latest workplace trend. It's about building a relationship that brings out the best in people. When your mentality and approach shift from that traditional management to a coaching framework, you find much of that pressure on management is alleviated because you have the relationship through coaching to then manage when you need to manage. Rather than focusing on control and making things happen to produce your desired results, a coach's number one priority is building trust through curiosity and helping employees help themselves. So really guiding your employees to grow for themselves and for their future. Now, I would love to talk more about coaching because it's my favorite thing in the world to do. I've been doing it for many years in my career, but Edgar gets to talk about that. So I'm going to go ahead and pass this off to Edgar. Thank you, Raina. I appreciate it. Um, coaching versus management. First, let me say that there's a need for both. <laughs> both are necessary. One isn't better than the other. And it's, um, it's important to actually have a strong balance of both. I think the questions we have to ask ourselves is, when should I have my coaching hat on? And when should I have my managing hat on? And right. Edgar, I'm yeah. very glad you're talking about this today because it is one of the number one things I hear out of managers is I don't want to be a micromanager. And the thing is, you still have to manage your employees. As you said, one isn't better than the other. Managing and coaching are both vital to growing our people. So, so glad you're speaking on this today. Oh, thanks. It's, it's a need for both. You know, the question we have to ask ourselves is, um, what's the situation? Knowing the appropriate time to put my, my coaching hat on or put my manager hat on. Um, and sometimes it can be a fine line. And when I should do that, I'm going to walk you all through a couple examples of, of when I need to put my coaching hat on and when I need to put my manager hat on. So maybe you have a deadline on a project and you're getting close to that deadline. And you need to communicate with your team and remind them of that deadline. So I sent a quick message out to them on Teams. That would be more of me being a manager. Uh, now a coaching situation would be, let's take that same project. I reach out to the individuals on my team and I see if they need any support, or maybe I'm encouraging them to finish this project strong, or maybe uh, it's empowering uh, them to continue to push themselves. That would be me being more of a coaching position. Um, another example would be maybe I need to delegate or sign a new task and I have to pick individuals out and I have to build a team. That's me being more of a manager. But now since I have assigned those tasks to that team, maybe a week later, I'll follow up with those individuals and I say, hey, Raina, give me some input on that assignment. What have you been experiencing? Give me some feedback. What's been some of the challenges? First, what I'm doing is I'm letting Raina know that I value her perspective. Um, and I value what she has to bring to the table. So again, it depends on the situation. It depends on the situation. As a manager, I wanna clearly communicate the goal to my employees. I wanna select the right individuals for the task. I wanna set appropriate deadlines, um, conduct meetings and create a plan of action. As a coach, I need to understand the results are best achieved when inspiring and developing others to achieve those results. So I want to create a space where people can learn and think from questions. They can grow through feedback and be trusted to make decisions. But when they make mistakes, which they will, we all do, they can learn from the mistakes as well. So you're better at both coaching and managing. And when you do this, this helps with growth, engagement, retention, innovation, and creativity of the company. Last, um, a great coach is trying to continue to, to develop their people. A great manager is continuing to try to develop their people. And a great coach has a playbook. And what a playbook does is it translates vision, a strategy, it defines roles and responsibilities, and it helps individuals with being successful. And this is, this is where, excuse me, sorry. This is where a, a manager and a coach, and this is where M4P comes into place because it bridges the gap with the manager and a coach. M4P helps you with developing those action item coaching plans. It gives you access to data to guide your teams towards success. And it helps create that two-way feedback. 
Uh, it can help delegate those tasks and track those projects. So my question to you all is what does your playbook look like? What does your playbook look like? So Ben. All right, I'm gonna hop in here. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna dive into it and start talking about um, the engagement side of it. You know, right now we work with organizations all across the country and they're, they're, they're one of the biggest things they're talking to us about is how do we retain our employees? How do we retain our employees? How do we engage them and keep them? We're really struggling with these things. And it's not a one trick pony type of answer that's really gonna solve this process for them. But those organizations that have kind of shifted where they have made engaging their people and growing their people, they're a brand in the business that's separating themselves right now. They really understand that their most important asset is their people. And other organizations that haven't made that shift are the ones that are really struggling with that retain, uh, retention piece. And so just understanding that it becomes a priority now. It can't be just kind of a nice to have, it's a must have. And do you have someone in your organizations that really focused on the development, the coaching, the management, the people asset and really maximizing that holistically? You know, because engagement comes from a ton of different factors. You know, your workplace culture, your organization communication, they you know, come from all these different factors that really bring people in. Um, but today we're really focusing on that managerial style, right? We've all went to school. We've all been in classrooms all the time. Was every teacher creating the same exact engaged learning environment than the other teachers? Absolutely not. I can think back of like the A plus managers slash teachers, right? That I had a chance to experience. And I can think of the ones that were totally not bringing me in and engaging me in that, in that environment. And so you know, as we work with organizations, what I find to be interesting is I'll say, what keeps you up at night when it comes to your managers? And they go, I don't know what they're saying to my employees or how they're even saying it. Right. So they don't know what environment and style that, that manager's bringing to the table. And is that a, is that a positive in terms of their ability to retain and grow their people? Or is that a negative? We talked, we started this out by sharing that, Hey, there's a 12 year gap between people actually getting managerial training versus when they get their first direct report. So organizations that are really saying, I want to retain, engage, and develop my people, they're making this a huge priority, okay? And so we want to make sure that as one big takeaway is you do understand how important it is, and it starts with development of that managerial level. Now, when we talk about engagement as well, I want to, I want to talk about you know, people do really want to be challenged. They want to be understood. They want to be valued, right? And so all of your employees want to be heard. They want to be valued. And are you creating an environment where they can connect with their managers? Have you given them the time and space and how you've designed your work weeks that that can, that can happen, right? That you really are creating that connection where there's that communication chain and they're understood and valued and value between that manager and employee. And for us, we're looking at, you know, how can we make sure that our managers have that time and space and then they can push their employees, they can coach them to hit those goals, they can maximize the engagement across their organization on that one-to-one -one scenario with each employee in their group. And within those conversations, we want to make sure that they're constructive, like Rain and Edgar were talking about, but there's celebration, there's growth, there's success, there's energy around it and, and really separating and, and bringing the best out of that person. And a lot of it's through positivity. And so um, just thinking of that, right, Pri prioritizing it and making sure that that manager level is equipped, that they can go engage with engage and drive the engagement with your people is huge. You know, and so I want to dig in a little bit further, too, on just, you know, what people what employees really, really want and what that feedback loop should look like. And so. When organizations, the highest level of employee engagement and satisfaction makes it easier for employees to give them feedback, all right? So one of the things that we look at is a lot of the organizations we work with, I said the time and space. So there's that one-on-one -on -one connection where feedback can happen. We, we're big into having to make sure it's clear, it's precise, it's, it's providing clear feedback on things that they need to develop on and have a playbook like Edgar was talking about that they can develop them through that playbook. 
make sure it's more continuous, right? If you're only having annual reviews or only connecting here and there, are you really creating a feedback loop that's continuous that people are looking to be developed on a faster rate than ever before? But is there six, nine months, 12 months of gap between that continuous feedback? Because we want to really prevent that from happening if you're giving your people the time and space to have that connection and give that feedback. And we are huge into creating a culture where it's a team first mentality. Managers and employees, they're winning together right now. There's definitely cultures and organizations where, you know, still happen, but a lot more in the past. But I hired you to do a job, do the job. You're not doing the job, you're fired, right? And there was not that I'm winning together with that employee. And so our goal is, is really making sure when you're developing those managers that they know what mentality they're walking into, right? What mentality should they have as they're approaching feedback and communication with their employees, okay? And then don't ever forget to invest in your A team, all right? Keep an employee is way more cost effective than finding a new one. And one of the easiest ways to retain employees is in investing in them. And sometimes organizations will spend a lot of time with people that maybe are underperforming and not really spending enough time with their A players, okay? And so in the M4P system, and we believe is you need a plan and approach for each one of your employees, like if you don't know where they're at, each person in their development, you're behind the curve as an organization, but make sure that you get as much time with your A team and getting them developed to be your future managers, maybe before they've even hit those marks and not just saying, hey, you're doing a good job, keep it up. I got to go spend time with these other people that are struggling because that's, you're going to lose those people. They want to be developed. They want to have strategic conversations. They want to learn how to be better within people management and success within their roles. And don't take that for granted. Okay. And at the same time, why is there a big gap between, you know, a 12 year gap between why some people are getting um, opportunity, you know, they're getting a management opportunity, but they're not getting training. It's because you see someone that you think is a good performer and you just go, hey, they can manage a person. That's easy. Go ahead and manage this person. And that decision or that thought process that, that is easy and they don't need development on that is, is a huge miss. Okay. People need support in developing these skill set. There are some people that could be very natural at it, but most people don't have this automatic ability to do it holistically. They're either managers that are super nice and everyone loves them, but they can't have those managerial tougher conversations. And so you're not getting peak performance if you're missing that portion of it, or they're the manager that is super tough and all they do is manage really difficult and they, they lack the connection piece of it. And they're losing people or driving people crazy because they're, they don't have that ability to balance that winning together with the employee approach and that how to talk about things in the right way. And so you can't assume your, your managers that you just are just perfect and can do both sides of it. You got to figure out where their strengths are and to develop some of those weaknesses through practice, through coaching, through repetition um, that are going to get them to be that holistic manager um, within that process. And we believe that wholeheartedly at M4P. We believe that you have to have the ability to create a system for managers um, that they can follow and it can be scalable within your business and then give them the coaching conversations around how to communicate and connect. Um, so they, they have a good playbook to really make things happen for your, for your employees. And so I want to hop into a few Q&A here. Um, what questions pop up as we kind of talk about this 12-year gap and some of the challenges you guys might be facing in developing this managerial level within your business? Okay, one, one question here. Um, as part of improving coaching, do you have any recommendations on how to measure progress regularly, once per year, once per month, or should it be more often? How about uh, Reina? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it, as Ben was speaking, I was hoping somebody would ask this question. We have a really clear cadence for our team members. We do four more formalized conversations that might look more like a typical performance review. We just call them a, com a quarterly conversation. 
We ask that all of our managers have at least a once a week, one-on-one, -on -one, where it's really about the person's development, not about projects. We get really stuck in one-on-ones like talking about workload rather than talking about the person and where they need to go and where they want to go. And then we do encourage the cadence of feedback in the moment feedback right after the moment. Clearly, we're not going to do that on a partner call, but feedback as quickly as we can give it to an individual so that they can learn and apply it for the future. So quarterly conversations once a week, at least for our touch points on coaching and development. Um, and then we, of course, sprinkle in some more formalized training opportunities, but we want that coaching to really be individualized for the individual that once a week and then feedback when we can give it as close to the event as possible. Great question. Okay, great. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a great question, right? I'll add a little bit to that as well. You know, again, it kind of depends on the situation, depends on the individual um, and how, how much I need to give them that feedback. Uh, but you want to make that something that's a part of a part of your process, because as a coach and Ben talked about this earlier, it's about the relationship building and it takes time to build relationships. So we have to come into it uh, thinking and understanding that this takes time. And what I have to do is continue to apply the work and, and reach out to the individual and get feedback from them. And then over time, what will happen is you actually start to have people come to talk to you about what's going on just through building relationships. You know, that response, Raina, makes me think you said earlier about there's a tendency for people to want to undermanage now because of the micromanaging kind of stigma that can happen. Um, and I interact with organizations all the time right now, and they've, they've, they'll, they'll be hesitant to kind of do coaching conversations and have that um, but I know that's part of the reason they're having issues retaining people is because they're hesitant. What do you, what do you say to that? What do you say to someone that's maybe thought, you know, coaching and, you know, is, is a micromanagement and it's actually causing under management. That's a good question, Ben. I think because we, we sometimes have created these sensitive environments where we feel like if you manage, you're hurting people's feelings and really management should be about helping people get results. Like you mentioned the winning together. That's what managing and coaching is all about because if people don't do the tasks they need to do and we're not managing a project or managing results, we're not going to be able to accomplish our business objectives. So it is this balance of when to manage, when to coach, but doing both does create the relationships and the trust that both of you have spoken about in your topics and your sections today. Um, we want people to know that when we go to them, it's not giving them negative feedback all the time. It's it's getting with them enough where it's positive feedback and critical information to help them grow, be constructive. But all of those things together is what creates that relationship. So you got to do you got to do all of them. Okay, no, that's great. Um, another question come up: Are there any tips to help encourage or coach our employees to share their ideas? Edgar, what are your thoughts there? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. First, um, it starts with the leader. If I want to encourage, um, you know, my team to, to share ideals and be open with me first, I need to come to the forefront and be able to share, share my ideals. I need to be able to share what I struggle with, uh, what I need to improve on. And then what that does is it, um, it lets people also know that you're not invisible, <laughs> that you're human. Um, and you'll be surprised when I, I, I enter a space and I uh, I am open about my ideas. I'm open about the ideals that I've tried and how I've also struggled at um, accomplishing those things. Um, over time, again, people start to uh, build that trust um, and be able to get to a place where they're sharing ideals as well. Sometimes people don't share their ideas based off their experience. Maybe they've been in another organization where they've talked about an ideal and um, it's kind of got shunned away or it, uh, we don't want to talk about that right now. So then a person leaves out of the meeting feeling devalued. They don't feel important. So what they do is they just say, you know what? Nothing matters. It doesn't matter what I think. So I'm not going to do it again. So again, it goes back to that trust and building those relationships. Um, and as leaders, we lead first um, and being able to first share our mistakes and let people know that we're, you know, we're human. And that takes time. And then through that, people start to be open with sharing those ideals. That's good. We've got a couple other questions popping in here. Um, 
one question that popped in is what do you do when you have an employee that's doesn't show any interest in developing learning engaging um in any of any of their own personal growth reina what do you think on that yeah i mean i have a snappy answer <laughs> which is that's that's probably not your a player and so when we had talked about earlier the time that you want to invest in your people they have to want it for themselves too. I've been a professional coach for about 15 years of my career. And one thing I will never do is, is chase people for coaching. We have set appointments, we have assignments that are takeaways, application assignments. And if they haven't done their assignments or done application to have a conversation when they return, we don't have our meeting. So I think here, you have to decide where to invest your time. We only have so much time in a day. I want to invest my time in people who are interested in that. Now, if that's an individual who's doing their job and doing their job well, we would call that a core player. And we need core players too. We wouldn't consider them maybe the high performing, high potential uh, person that we want to grow into leadership, but they could be a really valuable team member. And if that's the case, then you keep them in that stable position, providing support to your company, but go invest your energy in growing the people who want to move forward. Um, that would be my recommendation. You know, and, I, and what I would add too is like we we do our quarterly um, conversations with our employees, but a portion of that quarterly conversation acts more like a motivational section and a stay interview. And so, um, understanding kind of the motivational things that matter to each employee. And so, it sounds like you have an employee that doesn't want that coaching. As long as you can create an I, you know, we're on the same page, right? Create a same page with that person, and you're meeting the other maybe satisfaction components that they're looking for, if they're going to do their job and they're going to do it well, and they're going to stick with you, great. But you have to figure out, are you on the same page or not? And so that's something we work with our managers on to make sure that's a portion of our coaching conversations. Um, another question here is how do you get managers to buy in to invest the time it takes to provide regular feedback when a manager has 20 employees and they just don't have the time? I'm going to take that one. Um, one of the things I've seen a recent article on this. I think it was like in the Wall Street Journal or Forbes, but I see this a lot too, is they're saying that part of the great resignation that's happening is the how organizations develop their org charts for years over years is actually leading to some of these challenges that they're having. Raina spoke earlier about creating stretch growth and impact for employees and the opportunity to kind of take on new things and grow in their careers but for a long time, organizations wanted to create very flat organizations. And so there wasn't more this natural ascent that they could create to give people more opportunity. And so if you have someone that's managing 20 employees, what I would say is I would really consider how you set up the org chart in that department. Maybe you have multiple managers. Maybe you have like a, like a lead and that lead takes the coaching for a, a number of those employees. But a 20 to one ratio, it could lead to very problematic scenarios with retention. And it could be very cyclical uh, or, you know, like never ending because you you don't have the org chart structure that's going to appease future retention and growth of those people. And so I, I would just take a step back and think about what would I do today in an org, org chart scenario to create the right environment? And that doesn't mean you have to make big promotions, but someone could take some of those coaching opportunities within those 20 to help alleviate some of that um, bottleneck. And if you can't make a change to your org chart, because that, that could take time, I think what you have to help the manager understand is that if you don't provide regular feedback, you're going to see attrition. Employees look for feedback. And so you're going to invest more time in the long run, having to hire, train, develop a new person than taking... Sometimes it's just, it's a minute, it's two minutes of your time just to provide that feedback. It doesn't have to be a half hour conversation. So getting them to invest that time early on and often versus, well, I have to set 30 minutes aside. That's just not the reality for a lot of people who have these massive um, reporting structures. No, great point. Um, all right, we're, we're coming up on our time right here um, on this. Feel free to reach out to us at any point with questions that you might have. Um, one of the things that we do, we believe so strongly in creating coaching cultures that we do a 90 day pilot uh, program for organizations where they can taste test our methodology and what we do. Um, and so if you have any interest in taste testing that with one department, et cetera, let us know. 
get a chance to work with our team and how to take the right steps to create an ideal situation for the long run. Would love to do that. And I want to take a second before we leave just to um, introduce our next part of this series as well. You know, we're halfway through this reinventing performance strategy series. And the next webinar is going to be turning me meetings from a waste of time to your secret weapon. And we want to bridge the people component of your business with productivity of your business, with profits with your business. And to do that, you have to have something that brings it all together. And that's part of what we're doing here with M4P. But we really feel like if you can have great meetings and everyone knows what they're doing, how they're, what they're supposed to do, they can be so much more efficient. You can stay on, ta on task with everything you're doing and really move your business forward. And ultimately those coaching conversations then tie right into the meetings and the objectives you're running as a business. And that's where we want to get our organizations to. And everyone wants to be successful. They want to make more money. They want to be profitable. And so um, I really look forward to having you listen in on the meetings because we think it's a secret weapon um, on top of coaching managers to get you guys to the next stop. So thanks again for your time. Um, if you have any questions, just let us know. You'll get some information and follow up from us. But thanks again for joining us.